Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Live from PON. Today, Michael Wheeler will speak to us about improvising agreement, strategic agility, and quick on your feet tactics. My name is Susan Hackley. I'm the Managing Director of PON. I'm so happy to welcome you on behalf of the Program on Negotiation of Harvard Law School. PON is a consortium program of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts universities. This talk will be recorded and will be posted on the PON website in a few days. We will also be able to share the PowerPoint slides with you after this talk. You come from all over the world and many of you, like us in the United States, are suffering the effects of the coronavirus. Uh, we hope that you and your families, friends and coworkers are doing well in this difficult time. We're all on Zoom and maybe you hear my dog barking in the background. I apologize for that, I thought it would end. Um, I wanna thank Diane Long and Anna Chang for helping us today. <laughs> if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have a comment, you can write it in chat. Now I'm happy to introduce today's speaker. Michael, Michael Wheeler has been on the faculty of Harvard Business School since 1993. His research and teaching there have focused on the dynamic improvisational nature of negotiation. He's the author of the book, The Art of Negotiation, Improvising Agreement in a Chaotic World. And he was a longtime editor of PON's scholarly journal, The Negotiation Journal. In recent years, Professor Wheeler's work has centered on the use of computer-based technologies to teach, study, and manage negotiations. In spring 2020, he co-chaired with Jim Sabanius, PON's conference on artificial intelligence, technology, and negotiation. Thank you, Mike Wheeler. I just wanted to express my uh, thanks to uh, Diane and Anna for helping out here, and especially uh, you, Susan. You and I have been colleagues for, what, 20 years now, and um, it has been fun and instructive to uh, work with you and learn from you. So thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Let me introduce myself as well. Um, that isn't my window behind me, but it is a picture of a place that is, oh, a quarter of a mile uh, at most from our home here in Gloucester, Mass. I'm very lucky in many ways, wonderful family, uh, good health and so forth. I love my career. But I also live in the community in which I grew up. I'm half a mile from the house that, uh, that I was raised in. And in between the two things is Lighthouse Beach, and you're seeing it there. The photograph was taken by a friend of mine. Um, I just got it today, as a matter of fact, uh, Bobby Cunningham. So it's wonderful to see people that uh, I've known forever who remember my grandparents and I went to kindergarten. That's my story. I'm home and uh, happy to say, Susan, everybody in our family is healthy, and I know that's the case with you as well. Let me share my screen, and what I'm going to do rather quickly, and I want to be sure we've got everything set, and we do. Um, uh, what I want to do is run through a slide deck uh, very quickly so that we have time for uh, Q&A. And Diane is going to throw the questions uh, up to me. Um, you mentioned my book, Susan. Uh, this is in the spirit of a book that was published several years ago, and I continue to learn as things go on. Um, let me push through these slides. Everybody knows or should know um, the most popular and influential book of all time, Getting to Yes, uh, written some decades ago by my colleagues, the late Roger Fisher, Bill Urey, and uh, Bruce Patton. Um, it really transformed our field of negotiation. It legitimized it. It showed that there were more ways of uh, coming to agreement than just haggling back and, and forth. There was a book that followed called Start With No. I don't think it's an accident that the covers look similar uh, but there's a big difference between yes and, and no. Um, Camp celebrates himself as the number one negotiation coach. Um, 
good for him. <laughs> I'm feeling a little flippant today, obviously. Um, but, but I must say, with all due respect to Roger, Bill, and Bruce, um, I think there is one thing in common between those two books. And that is that they purport, they purport to provide a path, a single way of doing things. Whereas I'm skeptical about one size fits all uh, approaches to negotiation. Negotiation is a dynamic process. Uh, there's always uncertainty in it. This is Jeff Bezos making this point generally in life. And um, there's a point where we've studied hard, we've prepared well, but it's time to sit down and start negotiating. When I speak of uncertainty, I know I'm not going to read through all of those, and you uh, will be able to get a, a set of these slides, a subset of these slides. But you go into negotiation, I trust, hopeful and so forth, but maybe wary. You know, are you going to come to agreement or not? Is this going to be easy or is it going to be hard? And as a consequence, you've got to have flexible strategy. We have a, a program uh, that's dated back about 20 years, Susan, uh, the Great Negotiators Program that is launched by our friend uh, Jim Sibanius. And that's Lakdar Brahimi, a diplomat originally from Algeria, who goes to the world's toughest troubling spot, trouble spots. And um, he has an interesting view of negotiation. He is respectful to uh, getting to yes, but he also has a point of view. And uh, I've got to go back here. Bear with me. We didn't launch the video here, but I can, uh, you can read it here. When he met with us in the early aughts, um, he turned to Roger Fisher and said, uh, you know, respectfully that if you have a, a rigid plan, um, it may be a starting place, but you're never gonna have everything in your chart or in your map. There's gonna be something that could trip you up. And it might be something small, but it uh, pokes a hole in your boat. And in the worst case, you sink. So I don't believe you can script negotiation. In fact, I don't think Roger, Bruce, or Bill would say that you can. Uh, but the question is, what, what do you do given the uncertainty and the dynamic nature of negotiation? Let me give you a little example of what I think it means to be a good improviser and uh, strategically nimble. This is based on a real case. I've changed the names of the people. Um, Jay was a bright young guy when this, uh, when this transaction happened, and now he's a very prominent uh, um, person. Um, he had taken a year off to work with a, an investment company. Uh, most of his career has been academic, but they were looking to uh, buy a cable television uh, system in a Midwest town and their metrics in terms of how many subscribers uh, there are and so forth. And they were prepared to pay his firm, oh, 11, five, $11 million, 500,000. If really pressed, they might've been willing to go to Million, but that would have been absolute the most they would pay. They went back and forth with Max, who owned the system, and there's a big gap between Max's 15, which was the very least he would accept, and the most that, um, that Jay was willing to pay. Not everything's negotiable, and you can't kind of wish away that problem. But I'd like you to think for a moment as you look at that, how was it when Max said, the very least I'll accept for my system is $15 million. And frankly, I'll second guess myself if I say yes to that. Jay took that to be a firm uh, offer and that Max wasn't gonna budge. Jay then said something and 10 minutes later, they were shaking hands on a deal. Let me show you how Jay did it. They traded places. 
Jay went in there eager to buy this property, but Max was even more eager to buy what Jay already owned, a system in an adjoining town. So they were able to agree on a price for Jay's that was $14 million and change. They had bought the system only a year earlier for 8 million and that was largely leverage. So it was agility on Jay's part that he could see in impasse a um, possibility of a great deal for both of them. And what's interesting is that Max on the other side of the table was looking at the same numbers, was looking at the same gap and where Max saw that as an obstacle to agreement, Jay was agile enough um, to see it as an opportunity for a different kind of agreement that he hadn't foreseen. So I see negotiation as an ongoing dynamic process where you go in with some kind of general plan, you learn more, you adapt, you're trying to influence them, they're in trying to influence, excuse me, influencing you. And this is all in a strategic environment because when you make an offer, you're sort of testing the market, but the other person is reading or misreading it. And as a consequence, the landscape is always changing. I think that beyond offers and counter offers, threats and promises for that matter, we're negotiating how to negotiate and our hands are on the wheel, but so is somebody else's. And you're working out without necessarily naming it, the who, what, and how um, you are negotiating. When I got into this, there was very little work, um, certainly nothing in economics and so forth that, that presented a dynamic model. So I looked at other areas, we'll focus on two here, where to be um, brilliant, to be successful even, um, you've got to be nimble. Um, chess players, obviously, uh, depending whom you're playing and how the game is going, uh, are agile. Doctors test and diagnose as they prescribe and they watch what the reaction is and so forth. Then of course there's improv comedy. I want to look at military strategy with you and jazz as well, because those might seem to be the furthest away from uh, negotiation. There's a guy named John Boyd, and uh, we'll learn about John Boyd. Not a famous person, but he was a, a really ingenious thinker about combat strategy. And you might be wondering, how does that relate to negotiation? We'll get to that after I introduce right now, uh, Wynton Marsalis, the great jazz musician. And both have something to teach us about negotiation. Let's look at military doctrine. There's the old definition of the fog of negotiation and why, because of it, because we can't see the landscape perfectly, we've got to bake agility into our plan. We also have to think about best and worst case scenarios. And I'll give you Boyd's OODA loop in just a moment. This is from the United States Marine Corps War Fighting Manual, except I've edited it. And the manual says all actions in battle take place in an atmosphere of uncertainty. Well, you could say that's true in negotiation. The fog of negotiation I've adopted it as. Uncertainty pervades negotiation in the forms of unknown about counterparts, about the environment, and even about the friendly situation. You think about negotiating as part of a team, there can be no unknowns in that as well. Here's the punchline at the very bottom. All actions in negotiation will be based on incomplete, inaccurate, or even contradictory information. That is D-Day in World War II. Somebody in the military said, plans are worthless. Planning is everything. That was General Eisenhower, who was the architect, the commander in chief of the D-Day uh, invasion, which was the biggest uh, military enterprise in world history then and still is um, now. Plans are worthless, planning is everything. Uh, we'll see that theme in jazz as well. You've got to start somewhere, but you also got to be sure that you have a plan, but the plan does not have you. I'll give you an example. You may know this 
story. It's about a bunch of soldiers um, from Hungary who were training, this is in the 30s, in the Swiss Alps. Summertime, but there was a horrendous uh, blizzard way, way up when they were, you know, at, uh, you know, more than 10 or 15,000 feet uh, high. And their commander, their captain down in the valley was sure they were goners. They had been up there Monday, they're supposed to be back Tuesday, they didn't show Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they came in frost button, burned, excuse me, frost burned, uh, hungry and everything, but every one of them had survived. And the captain, after welcoming them back, said, how did you manage to get out? And the soldiers said, well, we had dug a snow cave for ourselves. We waited for the worst of the weather to drop. We had no idea where we were. But fortunately, we had a map. And we could walk out uh, of there kind of confirming where we were except it wasn't a map of the Swiss Alps. It was a map of the Pyrenees. You might ask, how would a map of the Pyrenees help you find your way in the Alps? And the answer had three parts. One is they didn't lose hope. They had confidence that they were going in the right direction. Second, when the blizzard stopped, it got them going. And third, they were constantly learning. They figured out where they were. They weren't right. They figured out where they were. They went on a ways and said, no, that can't be right. Maybe we're here. So they were constantly looking and observing and adjusting their path. Now, what's interesting, I think, is that if they had a map of Lake Erie or of the Sahara Desert, none of those things would have happened. It had to be something that was applicable in a general sense of the situation they were in. But I also wonder if they'd had a really detailed map, a whole atlas of every part of that portion of the Swiss Alps, I think they would have been overwhelmed with data. So that's an argument for having a plan, but it's a general plan and it's flexible and you're constantly adapting to it. That's going back uh, to uh, Brahimi and being um, aware that your map is incomplete. The Marine Corps, United States Marine Corps, are usually the ones who first have um, contact with whoever they're in combat with. They can't get into detail planning, but they have an interesting principle, and I think this applies to negotiations that you have to do on the fly. What is the most likely thing to happen? What's the most dangerous thing that could happen? And when you've done that, you've not covered all the possibilities, but what you have done is deal with the most important ones. Not a bad rule in negotiation either. I mentioned John Boyd earlier. He was a pilot who had flown in the Korean uh, uh, conflict and later became an important person in the Pentagon. He flew an F-86, that's a MiG-15. The MiG-15 was a Russian built plane and eventually they were flown by Russian pilots. Uh, it was faster, more heavily armed, and could climb higher than the American plane. And yet, as you can see, the American plane prevailed in 90% of the cases. And Boyd wondered why it was. Well, part of it was that the pilot in the American plane had better situational awareness. He, and they were all men at that time, he could see around more easily than the pilot in the Russian built plane. Also, not as fast, um, couldn't climb as high, but much more nimble, could climb and drop, pitch and yaw and so forth. And as a consequence with every move the pilot would make, they'd compound their advantage. From that, Boyd mentioned, excuse me, I shouldn't say mentioned, you know, zeroed in on the importance of situational awareness, which is what we need in negotiation. And there are four steps to it. One is observing, taking a clear look at what actually is happening on the ground. Orienting, I'm gonna come back to this because this is the most important part. This is what you expect to see. This is when you compare it to the reality that's unfolding, what is actually going on. You make a decision with some intention, you act upon it, and then 
maybe it works out or maybe in negotiation you meant something as a generous offer it's been read as a sign of weakness so the trick is in i think chess and in warfare and in negotiation is looking for mismatches where is something that wasn't in your plan or wasn't in your expectations and you constantly want to be going around in that cycle Again, this will be in your slides if you want to have a, a deck. I won't read through the whole thing, but there are many elements of having a strategy that is supple and can change as you learn more and as conditions change. That's what shifting to jazz, another one of our great negotiators was the ambassador, US ambassador, Richard Holbrook. And you can read what he says about it. He likens negotiation to jazz as being nonlinear. That's Wynton Marsalis. Listen to what he says what jazz is. The real power of jazz and the innovation of jazz is that a group of people can come together and create art, improvised art and can negotiate their agendas with each other. And that negotiation is the art. Like you'll hear all the time, Bach improvised, and he did improvise. But he wasn't gonna look at the second viola and say, okay, let's play Ein Feisty Berg. <laughs> they, weren't, they were not gonna do that. Whereas in jazz, you, I, I could get together, I could go to Milwaukee tomorrow, and it'd be three musicians, I walk into a bar at 2.30 in the morning and say, uh, what you wanna play, man, let's play some blues. Well, all three of us, all four of us are gonna start playing. And I might say, do 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 and I'll say, bo, 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 do bo, do 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 Everybody will just start comping and playing and listening and the bass, you never know what they're gonna do. So that's our art. The four of us can now have a, have a dialogue. We can have a conversation. We can speak to each other in the language of music. You notice here's Winton um, saying that uh, jazz is negotiation and you've got Holbrook saying negotiation is jazz. Um, I love that confirmation. Um, there's a wonderful book, Yes to the Mess, written by my friend and colleague, Frank Barrett. And he talks about how leaders can learn a great deal from jazz. I've translated that to negotiation. There are three things I'm gonna look at quickly. One is a form of deep listening I call pain heed. Two is having some structure, but not a binding one. And three, this may seem uh, strange in negotiation con uh, context, but knowing when to be provocative. Let me walk you through that. In the mid-1980s, there was a historic conference um, between Ronald Reagan and, um, and Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. And the attempt was to come to a, a strategic arms agreement. Um, it did not work out. That's George Shultz, who I believe is still alive and is nearing 100 years old. He was the Secretary of State. And at that meeting in Iceland, a guy named Akramayev, who was the head of the Soviet military, at the time uh, was there and they hadn't been expected. And um, we go back, oops, we wanna go back then forward. Let me take you back. We want to go back to Akramayov. Ak they wanted to figure out who Akramayov was. And so Schultz uh, got a private meeting with him. In the course of the meeting, Akramayov said, you must understand uh, secretary, that I'm one of the last of the Mohegans. This is a Russian referring to a, a classic American book. I'm one of the last of the Mohegans. And Schultz said, uh, excuse me, what do you mean last of the Mohegans? And Akramayev said, well, a lot of the people who were in World War II with me uh, died. Um, some are old and taking a rest. Here I am still in uniform. Schultz then asked, but how do you know about the last of the Mohegans? And Akramayev said, oh, I read all of James Fenimore uh, Cooper's book when I was young. I loved those books. And from that comment, 
Schultz got a sense that Akramayev was a guy who understood us at least to an extent, who was willing to reach out. They did not come to an agreement on that, but he was that relationship between the two men was very important when the Berlin Wall came down. Um, and that is what I call pain he uh, with a follow up question. Jazz people do it too, right? You know, you can't improvise on nothing. You've got to have something. The great Charles Mingus on bass. And as to being provocative, first time that jazz was played at Carnegie Hall in New York, they start the the Benny Goodman band starts with a um, classic, "Don't Be That Way," and it's elevator music. It has no pop whatsoever. And over on the left, you see Gene Krupa a legendary drummer, and he goes nuts on the band. And a jazz critic later said that Krupa wasn't trying to wake up the crowd. He was trying to wake up the band, grab them by the lapels. He was trying to relax them. I love this. Relax them or scare them beyond their fear. Sometimes your time in negotiation, you've got to kind of shake things up. And as an example of that, we have another one of our great negotiators who came to the program in negotiation, George Mitchell. He uh, appropriately celebrated for the Good Friday Accords in Northern, uh, Northern Ireland, but that didn't put the end to all the fighting. And he went back to Belfast, you know, dozens of times. And at one point he said this meeting of the IRA on one side and the loyalists on the others, 20 people on each side of the table staring at each other. He said, what you read here, Every time I come back to Belfast, I know what I'm gonna hear from you. I'm gonna sit and listen to you guys saying the same thing over and over again, every time. So he was grabbing them by the lapels and saying it's time to move on. Now he wouldn't have said that on day one, he wouldn't have said it on day 20, but he'd known them for a long time. And he wouldn't have said that to any of them alone. He was scolding both sides equally. So again, I think we're talking about improvising um, uh, in real time. That's not something that he could have planned for or anticipated. We come back to Lakhdar Brahimi, who visited with us as a great negotiator. Read his comments here about keeping an open mind, and this is really critical. Don't ask reality to conform to your blueprint, but transform your blueprint to adapt to reality. That's what great negotiators do. So if you're interested in my work, um, there's the book that Susan kindly mentioned. I've got a podcast going with Kim Leary. You can get it on uh, uh, iTunes or Google, other platforms and so forth. I blog about negotiation on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm looking forward to engaging with you uh, one way or another on those, on those platforms. I also have in the deck books that I'm fond of in um, negotiation, and there are a whole lot more that could be on that list, um, but I encourage you to, uh, to mine it. And then finally, before I throw it back uh, to the team at uh, the program negotiation, I wanna say thanks. I've enjoyed this first part. I'm gonna enjoy even more um, uh, addressing your questions. So I'm gonna stop the screen share now and um, look forward to hearing the questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, that was an incredibly um, well-rounded presentation of um, how to use um, adaptable negotiating skills. So what we have is we have a few questions. Um, so far, and I'm hoping the audience will feel free to put many more questions in our Q&A section. Here is the first question. I'm all for agility and curiosity and finding agreement, but what indicators have worked for you to notice when there doesn't seem to be any potential option that is better than your BATNA? Well, first thing, um, not everything is negotiable. Second, I'll tell you a story. I remember doing some consulting for an energy company in another state. And this was very high level because there was a big deal on the table. And the person at the end of the table, the CEO said, I want to tell you, in all our negotiations, I've been here 18 years, we've never failed to reach agreement. 
I kept my mouth shut because the CFO was there, all the other top level people. But when I met privately with the CEO, CEO I said, you say you've never failed to come to agreement. That's worrisome. There are two possibilities. One is that you're being too agreeable, that you're saying yes just for the sake of agreement, even when in fact it isn't in your interest. The second possibility is you're not being daring enough. If, if there's something which, which looks as if it could be a terrific accomplishment, but it's a long shot, you might want to try it. If you never fail, maybe you're not reaching high enough. So I'm speaking right there to the question of, of if there's agreement. Now, having said that, I would take it back to what we're talking here about adaptability, that case that I gave you about Jay and Max. It is possible sometimes that the nature of the um, disagreement, in this case, it was Ma the difference agreement about the value of Max's system made it impossible for Jay to buy it, but sent a signal that Max must think the cable business is even better than, than Jay himself did. So they turned the deal upside down. So I think there are times, and it's not inevitable, that the impasse is a path to a very different kind of agreement. Thanks for the question. Excellent. OK. Um, how would you suggest one balance preparation in improv when negotiating across cultures? Mm -hmm. Oh, a couple of things there. Um, first, I want to back up a little bit on, on culture. There are some good books on culture. Um, the, uh, um, and I, I don't want to trash them, but wherever you're, you're from, uh, wherever the questioner is from in this case, you certainly know that all the people uh, in your country don't negotiate in the same way. All the people in your <laughs> in your community and maybe all the people under your roof don't necessarily have the same negotiation styles. So I'm very leery about uh, hard and fast rules. On the other hand, there are questions of, of behavior and etiquette. There are places where you can say flatly no, um, and there are others where that has to be expressed more, uh, more gracefully. So I, I understand what you're saying in that regard. And um, Sometimes um, it's good to bring that to the surface if you're dealing in a different culture. Um, you can say, you know, I'm from so and so, and we do things in a particular way. Uh, please give me guidance if I miss misstep, and I'd appreciate knowing how you approach these kinds of problems. This goes back to the negotiating how you negotiate, right? So you're negotiating who we are and how we're gonna gauge each other. And I, I, I think bringing it to the surface is a good thing. Final thing I'll say about culture is there's culture in the sense of what language you speak and what values you've grown up with. There's organizational culture. And I've seen that in the consulting and advisory work that I do. Um, uh, culture in a publishing um, or in an entertainment uh, uh, company, very different from one that's in engineering. I'm still speaking in generalities, um, but uh, we all get socialized in one way or another. And it's not just what school we went to, but, uh, but what, what we pursue. Good question so far. Is there another one, Diane? Oh, there are many more. <laughs> um, negotiations can often get rather emotional, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest that one, stay calm yourself, and two, try to get your counterpart to stay calm? Uh, great question. Um, I have a wonderful colleague who's involved with the program of negotiation, Kimberlyn Leary. And um, Kim has so many different things uh, going. Uh, she is presently on the transition team for uh, Joe Biden's presidency. So she is doing very important work in that. She is also a clinical psychologist and I've learned a lot from her. In 19, excuse me, 19, in 2013, she and I published an article in the Harvard Business Review called Negotiating with Emotion. Negotiating with emotion, the sense of feeling passionate about it, but also negotiating with our own feelings, as it were. So I encourage you to find that. And in it, there is a six-step um, six plan for um, being emotionally centered, for 
for negotiation. I'll see if I can do it off the top of my head. And if I get five out of six, is that good enough? Absolutely. Good, good. I'll see if I can do better. So I would ask the, the person who posed the question, before you negotiate, think about what you want to feel going into that negotiation. Maybe you want to feel confident. Maybe you want to feel calm and relaxed. When I do this exercise in class, it's interesting to get the different things that people want. What do you want to feel? Second thing coupled with that, obviously, is why do you want to feel it? Well, I want to be focused. I, I, I don't want to appear nervous to my counterparts. There are lots of things, and this gets developed in the article. What do you want? Number one, what do you want to feel going into negotiation? Number two, why do you want to feel? Third, how are you going to get yourself to feel that way? Now, most people don't even think of that. But what you don't want to do when you get a telephone call and you're in the middle of something and it's a person that you're negotiating with, I don't think you should pick up the phone and me to say, okay, let's get started. I think you want to say, can I give you a call back in two minutes? I just want to wrap up what's on my desk. And then you can take the deep breath that you need to do. You need to get centered. You need to think about what, what you're going to do. So, so um, you don't want to be late to a negotiation. Um, um, ordinarily, I can be a little flexible with time deadlines, but I don't want to go in tense. Fourth question. What can throw you off while you're in the middle of a negotiation? Somebody gets angry or whatever the case may be, or they're being stubborn. Everybody will have our own little triggers. And what you need to know is what your trigger is. And so, you know, that first little bit of anxiety coming to the surface, you can take that breath. Um, then five, now that you know what can trigger you, what can you do to um, bring yourself back to the state you want to be in? And one of the things I just mentioned, take a breath or take a break for that matter. Or some people have visualization techniques. And the sixth thing is what do you want to feel when you're done? You know? um, and I think the, what's interesting is when I ask that question, a lot of people say this. The first thing out of the mouth is relieved. Now think about it. That tells you about the pressure that a lot of people bring to the, the table. And what you read as hostility may be defensiveness on, on their part. So the part of your question to ask, you know, uh, about affecting other people's feelings, that's right on. So I gave you the six. I got six for six, Diane. Pretty amazing. I didn't make any of them up as I was going, uh, going along. So if you can find that HBR article, there's more of it uh, in there. Another question, Diane? Yes, um, we have shared a link to the article in the chat. Wow. Yes. Um, okay, so here's an easy one. Are there good ways to prepare for improvisation? It sounds paradoxical, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> and I don't know what your impressions of Harvard Business School uh, are. Um, uh, it's a serious place, but you can be serious without being solemn. And in addition to listening to Miles Davis, um, my MBA students, in, as we do that in class, and Frank Barrett comes in and plays the piano, um, I have an improv uh, trainer come, come in. And there are principles that my students read about, but they actually have to do improv in real time. And they're like most of us, that doesn't come uh, uh, naturally. Um, but I want to go back to, to the question. If, the, if there is one central part of improv, and I think this applies across the board, including improv directly in negotiation, it's the deep listening. And if while the other person is speaking, you're saying to yourself, how is this going? Uh, what am I going to say next? Uh, what, what are they thinking? Listen. Listen, uh, my colleague at HBS, Allison Wood Brooks and others have done some very interesting work on uh, silence in negotiation. Jared Kern has a scholarly, out, scholarly piece out. He's at MIT on this as well. I took a pause there, right? Um, 
you'd be surprised how hard it is for some people to stop talking. Um, I've used um, a system, it's a sociometer, where my students all wear these things that are about, oh, a little bigger than a credit card. They register who's talking, how loud that is, um, uh, some gross body movements, but not, not an expression in the face, very crude stuff. But even that information is very predictive of how well people connect. Did it one time and um, there was a woman, a wonderful woman, student of mine, who was shocked to see that she was doing talking 70% of the time when we looked at the record over 30, 30 minutes. She didn't intend to do that. She didn't know that she was doing that. Now here, Diane, you know, I've got the floor. I understand that. So this is hypocrisy that I'm going on a bit, but um, uh, the question was posed and it's a good one. It's not a bad assumption to start with is you're talking too much. And you're talking too much, it, it can feel aggressive to the other person and beyond which you're not learning anything, you know? So um, I think the heart of improv is being good listeners. And then when they stop, you can buy a little of time. You can say, let me think about that, or I need to hear more, or would you consider this or that? You don't have to have the snap answer on the tip of your tongue. So hope that's helpful. Thank you. Well, the audience is um, very appreciative of how you're using storytelling as, as it's such a powerful tool. Can, I interrupt, can I interrupt on that, Diane? Because I'll sure. forget otherwise. Um, the uh, Susan will remember this one. Lakhdar Brahimi was with us, the Algerian diplomat, and people would ask questions, and he's far better at this than I am. When people would ask questions, he would always begin with, let me tell you a story. And it got to a point where in a very friendly way, everybody in the audience would laugh because that is the way in which he expresses himself. He expresses himself through stories. And I think there's a lesson there. Right. Instead of talking about abstractions and so forth, grounded in reality, people can understand where you're coming from. Now, Diane, I stepped on your toes. I did ask permission. Um, do you remember what you were going to ask? Yes, I do. So the audience is wondering if you could tell them your toughest negotiation story. Ooh, ooh. Uh, <laughs> toughest negotiation story. You know, I mean, this tests my improv skills, right? But it also suggests that I don't carry old baggage uh, with me uh, a long, uh, long way. Um, I can tell you one that I was involved in where I tried to be helpful. I was representing one of the parties and it was frustrating. And it was a battle between two neighbors and it wasn't just behavior, but somebody wanted to expand their house and the person next door was opposing it through what, from my point of view, because I represented the people who wanted to build the house, um, kind of doing all kinds of nutty things. Uh, they drilled a well right on the borderline because you can't, you can't build something on your own property if it's too close to somebody else's water. So there was a race to get through the permitting uh, process. This is something that should have been resolved um, much more cheaply and much more creatively. I don't know if you can hear, we've got seagulls on top of the house here. Susan had mentioned the dog uh, barking downstairs. I've got sea sea seagulls on, on the roof. What was frustrating, Diane, in that case is that both sides burned money on a dispute. And I think what was going on was the dispute was not about the building, was not about the view. There was some basic antipathy, uh, that's probably too weak a word, you know, slightly less than hate, but much more than anger between them. And when, as an outsider, it seemed to me, there were solutions that not only could have been created, but could have been respectful of the parties, they just weren't able to do it. And um, I wish I'd been a good enough mediator to, uh, to be helpful, but where I was representing one of the parties, it was hard to uh, assume that that role. So it, it's, it's tough to see something kind of slip through people's hands and, you know, crash on the floor. Well, thank you. Um, next question. 
being agile would seem to be particularly important in multi-party negotiations. Can you speak to how to use the concepts you mentioned to them? Well, what that adds is um, a, a further degree of uncertainty. So I'm going to do something here if I, if I can. Uh, if I'm going to ask people to be, um, be a little flexible here, if possible. I'm going to call something up and show you. Um, And I'm actually there. Oops, a daisy. Almost there. I'm going to go to um, share screen, if I may. And um, I think I've got everything set here, including the sound. So let me go to slideshow. And can you repeat the question so that everybody uh, has it? Diane, please. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, being agile would seem to be particularly important in multi party negotiations. Can you speak to how to use the concepts you mentioned to them? I'll give you a particular example. This is in one of my extra slides. It's a clip I have of one of my former students, Erin uh, Egan, who at the time was working at Microsoft. She's now with Amazon. Um, she has social radar and um, just incredible perception of what's going on in a room. And this was in a multi-party uh, room. She was in her mid twenties, she was an American. She'd gone to a nuts and berries school on the West Coast environmental policy. And somehow she'd landed a job with Airbus in, um, in France. And her boss recognized that she had this great social skill of figuring out what was going on and as a consequence being nimble. Her boss's boss recognized uh, it as well. And she was at a meeting between uh, Airbus and General Electric. She's not an engineer, she's not a finance whiz, but because she can read a room, she was uh, there. So let's hope that this, this works. Um, it'll run for about a minute and a half. For me, I mean, the, the vantage point I had when I was at Airbus is that I was not the lead negotiator. I was really a very junior person in the room. And so I had the luxury to be very observant. What's interesting is what's not said and body language. And you can learn a lot, especially if it's a team. Um, when someone on the team says something, watching how other people on their own team respond, that's extremely telling. You can understand if everybody's aligned. Because in a negotiation, this is very important, especially when you're with large corporations. There are, like I've said, there are so many people with so many different opinions that you need to figure out whose opinion matters and who's actually able to get something done. And if they have a quorum within their own team. And a lot of times they don't. So what I used to do is say, I think that they said this, but I don't think it's entirely true. Or I don't think the technology's ready. I think they're telling us it is, but I don't think it is. And they'd be like, why? Like, where do you come up with that? I'm like, well, because when the engineer said something, the other person looked at him like he was crazy. Or when the other guy shifted in his chair, very uncomfortable. And why would he do that if that was true? So um, that's that's Aaron, and uh, my advice would don't uh, don't play poker with Aaron because she's <laughs> she would not do it. Are we back to the regular screen now, Diane? Yes, we are. Good, good. So um, I think that was appropriate to the question. She's talking about dealing with a bunch of people across the table and try to figure out one who's influential and where there might be some schism between different uh, people on their team. It can happen on our team as well. So it seems to me if you're going into a complex um, multi-party negotiation, not bad to designate somebody to be observant in that way. Um, well worth having them in on the meeting. Another question, Diane? Yes. Um, what do you suggest to use 
or approach when your counterpart uses intimidation or threats in the bargaining table? Well, we have a wonderful colleague, Deepak Malhotra, who is um, on the executive committee of the, uh, of the program of negotiation. And he has a book, which is on my recommended list there, Negotiating the Impossible. Um, he has um, been involved as an advisor in some very, very difficult negotiations. And his advice on ultimatums is this, ignore them ignore them. When somebody says, take it or leave it, ignore it. The last thing you should say is, do you really mean that? If you say, do you really mean that? You know, they've already painted themselves a corner and you're giving them another brush. Ignore it. Ignore it. Um, um, sometimes people make an impulsive statement of that sort and can't get out of it. And the way to you know, find out whether it's real or not is to ignore it. And if they come back with it again, ignore it. Maybe a third time you say, okay, that's the, that's the way it is. That's where it's coming from. Um, but um, I think that's true of ultimatums and threats are basically that. If you don't do this, I'll do that. Um, ignore it. Now, there are certain points where you're gonna be very tempted to blow up. If that's the way you're gonna be, that's the end of this conversation. There's a milder way of saying that. Maybe this is a good time to take a break and we'll come back to this tomorrow. So um, the punchline on that is don't make a bad situation worse. All right, good advice. Um, okay, next question. Do you have a tip on how to deal with negotiations where there is a big power imbalance? Um, I suppose this is from somebody who has a great deal of power and uh, uh, wants to know how to deploy it. No, probably not. Probably not. Um, power is is very um, very subtle. You know, um, it can be how good your fallback is, um, but it also uh, goes to other people's vulnerability. The the there is a point. What do they say this saying, you know, if you owe the bank a thousand dollars, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank has a problem. Um, so, so there's a certain point where um, a character who's got nothing can actually play a, um, a very powerful disruptive role. I think there are other times where it's on balance and the question is, if it's you're negotiating for a raise or a promotion, um, obviously there's somebody who can give you a yes or a no. Uh, that person will want to be respected and treated accordingly to the extent that they're operating under some constraints, they're worried about precedent. You need to acknowledge that and give them a reason why you could be an exception. Um, this kind of dovetails into, and I'm mindful of the clock too here, but to one other thing, uh, I thought Debbie Kolb came up with this saying, but she says I did, so maybe I don't owe her royalties. To get a yes, expect a no. To get a yes, expect a no. So what if the other side says no, maybe because they're powerful or see themselves as powerful? How are you going to answer that? And there may be ways in which, as I say, you are justifiably, an exception to the rule that you're not creating a bad precedent, um, making clear you know, what your limits and constraints are and so forth. You wanna to get to yes, you wanna hear a yes, uh, but I think you gotta be prepared for the no and that's where the improvising comes in and a little bit of preparation of different things you could say or do under those circumstances uh, pays off. Thank you. Next question. In your references list, you mention a hostage negotiation book. According to you, what are the main differences between business and crisis negotiation? Well, this, I mean, as somebody who, you know, looks to jazz and military strategy for negotiation lessons, and the hostage negotiations, that sounds practically next door. Um, Voss's book is controversial. He, he is not as kind as he should be to some of uh, my colleagues. 
But I think when he gets into the interpersonal uh, stuff, um, he's got a lot of street wisdom and much of it is about listening and what to say. Um, so uh, uh, his lessons, his lessons are, are very powerful. And I've seen um, examples of things he's done under great, great stress. He, he learned to listen. He had been an FBI uh, hostage negotiator um, excuse, me, excuse me, on SWAT teams, um, blew out his leg, applied to be a hostage negotiator, and the woman who ran the department said, ever take a negotiation course? No. Ever take a psychology course? No. And she said, get lost. And Chris, being Chris, said, what do I have to do to get your attention? And she said, um, volunteer for a suicide hotline um, uh, service uh, for six months and come back to me. He did it, and she was shocked that he actually did it. But he learned how to listen on that, listen to people who at four o'clock in the morning were great in great distress. And some were close to taking their own lives and others were just lonely and sad. And trying to understand how you talk people down in that situation um, taught him very important lessons that are in the book uh, about how to uh, deal with, with people in a hostage situation, I think he makes a very good case for the fact that those skills are important in any kind of negotiation. So I commend it. Thank you. I think um, we'll have time for about two more questions. Here's the first one. What are the tricks to reopen negotiations that ended in deadlock? Um, I don't know that there's a trick per se. Uh, it won't happen unless you uh, uh, <laughs> take some action. One possibility is, you know, I've just been wondering whether we weren't imaginative enough in that in that last case, uh, in that case where we got stuck, or I just heard of somebody who seemed to be in a similar situation. I wonder whether we can learn some lessons from them, or maybe it's enlisting somebody else, your party A and their party B. You go over to see who knows both of you and says, you know you might encourage them to come back to me because I think it might be useful for us to talk again. So I, um, this is again, sort of in the spirit of negotiating the impossible Deepak Malhotra's book. One more? Yes. Is agility, learning, adaptability, a skill that can be developed? And do you have tips to practice this, to build this as a core competency? Yes and yes. Um, so, so if you if you buy my book, it, it won't buy me a cup of coffee in terms of royalties. Um, but you could look there and take it out in the library and so forth. That's what the book is essentially about. And yes, I do believe people can learn to do it. I've seen it actually happen. And the way in which you do it, I think, is you try it in low stakes uh, situations, where if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So, so I'm optimistic on that. I want to be respectful of the clock and everybody's time. I want to thank Anna and I and, uh, and Susan for their company on all of this and for all of you for, for listening in. I uh, hope we can stay in touch. Well, thank you, Mike, so much for this, this illuminating um, talk. We've really enjoyed it and um, I'm sure the audience is looking forward to reviewing your slides and um, getting to possibly review the video when we have it posted on the POM website. Oh, that's great. Um, I think I heard Anna say that you actually do have the, the handout deck, is that correct? We do indeed, we do indeed. We will be sharing it with um, all registrants after the event. It's so nice to be working with, with the three of you. Mike, this was just wonderful. Oh, good, Susan, good. Well, thank you for all your help. Hope to see you soon. See you soon. Bye.